we've been kind of, uh, the last couple weeks, uh, uh, or last week I started kind of going back to take a look at some of our, uh, our main uh, focus. Our main focus at the Fellowship Church is, is centered around trying to bring people into fellowship with the Father. Uh, you know, in, in, in that core. Ultimately, that's where we need to be, and that's where we want to bring people. And so last week, we talked a little bit about that. This morning, our message our message is always centered around that, but, but as I thought about fellowship with a family, which is uh, those of us who are believers, us getting together and us working together, one text that came to my mind uh, as I thought about that was was Hebrews uh, uh, 10. Uh, if you'll go, go back, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, just uh, Hebrews 10, verses 19 through 25. Verse 25 is the one that, that I, I really was really was focused on. And as I, I as I prepared for this message this week, and I looked at it, uh, you know, I, I come up with this. The main idea of the sermon this morning is just just getting closer. And so uh, when we talk about uh, trying to invite folks this morning, we, we just kind of put out there. Don't, don't you want to get closer to God? Don't you want to get closer? Uh, to your husband or your wife or to your family, or your, your children. Don't, don't you want to get closer, uh, uh, you know, to, to the people that matter? Don't you want to get closer to one another? Uh, you know, and, and so and ultimately, as I looked at this passage, that's kind of what I, what I thought, saw. And, and so getting closer this morning is what we want to talk about. And so uh, if you will, stand with me as we read from God's Holy Word this morning. We're going to read verses 19 through 25, and after after we're reading, obviously you can sit down and you can stay seated for a little while, but follow along with me as we read from God's Word this morning. God's Word says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain, that is, through His flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you this morning. Lord, we're excited about who you are. God, we're thankful today that, that so many have come here, God, to worship you and to hear your word. Right now, Lord, we pray that you would speak through me as your messenger. God, do your work in hearts and lives. Make us like Jesus. We ask it in his name. And for his glory. Amen. Y'all can be seated. <clears throat> Getting closer. You know, as I was thinking about that, I, 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 because of certain events, I guess, that are coming up, I, I, well, I'll just go ahead and talk. When I, I, I was thinking about back to the time when I was about to turn 16. I could not wait to turn 16. Y'all know why, don't you? Because I could get my license to drive. And, and, uh, you know, I'd already been driving since I was about 12 anyway, but, but uh, <laughs> I lived on a farm, and so, you know, I, I learned how to drive uh, when I was real little, but I couldn't wait to be able to drive legally, and uh, I, had a, I bought a 1965 Mustang when I was 14 years old, and I couldn't wait to legally get to drive that thing out on the road, you know, I mean, I was just excited about it. So, I, I, I did everything I could to arrange on my birthday, I laid out of school, I had my cousin, uh, I, you know, we arranged a little trip where he could take me to the driver's license place down in McMinn County, and I got my driver's license on my 16th birthday. Man, I was so excited. And, you know, I just remember how I planned that, you know, just getting closer and closer in the anticipation of it, you know. Well, this week, I'll be, I'll be celebrating her sweet 16. And so, you know, it's hard to believe it's that, that close. It seems like just a short time ago, you know, we were bringing her home, afraid to touch her because she was born early. We didn't want anybody else to touch her. You, know, you, had, to, you had to scrub down, you know, and all that kind of thing. It just seems like it's just such a short time to go. But, you know, now with five, we're a little freer with them. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, you, you, but, uh, but yesterday, <coughs> Alvin and Lana, they, they uh, you know, watched their daughter Kristen get married and the day that they watched and planned for with a lot of anticipation for months. You know, and as it got closer and closer, you know, the anticipation builds, 
the planning gets more intense and those types of things happen. And, <clears throat> and so I want you to think about that. I mean, is there a day that you're watching and you're getting, you know, that's getting closer and closer? Is there something that you're waiting on? You know, it may be a graduation, it may be a wedding, it may be a special birthday or a special anniversary. We got a birthday in the house today. I'm not going to say who, but uh, no. <laughs> But uh, we're, you know, we're celebrating, right? So, but anyway, <clears throat> um, as we think about this, you know, our text for today speaks of a day that's getting close. If you look down at the last part of verse 25, it talks about the day that's drawing near. Do you see that? The day that's drawing near, and, and it's referring to the day of judgment. That's what it's referring to. Um, Paul wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1, he said, in the last days, and that's the days that we live in, he, he told Timothy, he said, in the last days there will be difficult times. That's what he told him. There will be times of stress and tremendous pressure and hardship and darkness and evil. Folks, I believe we're living in those days. We're living in those days. It's not easy in 2014 to be a Christian, is it? It's tough. Life is tough in general. We live in a difficult time. And in fact, to be a Christian in some places in our world is deadly. You know, uh, it, it, it's a crime punishable by death to convert people to Christianity. And, and the day the writer of Hebrews is probably referring to here is uh, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, which happened around AD 70. So he's probably doing that. But it's more than that. It's a prophetic word speaking about the coming day of judgment. And so when we think about that, you know, listen, when that day comes, every person, you and I included, will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll stand before Him. Now, lots of folks like to make predictions about when this is going to take place, but I'm not going to do that. But what, what I will tell you is this, and I know this for a fact, that day is closer than it's ever been. It's getting closer. It's getting closer. It's getting closer. And so, listen, and the world we live in, as we wait for that day, is getting tougher and tougher to live in. Isn't it? And so, let me ask you something this morning. Do you want to see victory over the trials you face in this life? Do you, are you tired of loneliness? Are you tired of depression? Are you, are you tired of being enslaved to sin? Self-seeking pleasures that just destroy everything around you? Are you tired of that? Look, if you're tired of that, I want to give you the answer to your, to your troubles today. The answer is Jesus. He is the answer. You know, the answer is always Jesus. Seek Him first. If you want victory, you got to get closer. you got to get closer to God. And you get closer to God by getting closer to Jesus. Amen? And so that's what we want to talk about. How can you get closer? Well, this morning, that's what I want to look at. To gain victory over the trials of this life, we must get closer to Jesus, okay? We've got to get closer to Jesus. Well, how can we get closer to Jesus? We can get closer to Jesus by taking three actions. So three things, three actions you can take today to help you get closer to Jesus so that you can stand on the day of judgment. Number one, when we look at this text, the first, first action you, you can take is do this. Seek God with your whole heart. You know, I started to put, seek God with everything you got. Seek God with all you've got. That's kind of what the implication here is. You know, you don't seek God half-heartedly, in other words. Seek Him with everything you've got. You know, passionately. And we see, when we look in verse 21, you see the writer of Hebrews, he urges uh, us to draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. And he says, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And so what does all that mean? You know, that, that, that's where we get this point, seek God with your whole heart. Because he's saying, draw near with a true heart. So what's he getting at? Well, we have to kind of back up. We have to consider the whole book of Hebrews and what in the world it is he's talking about. Well, this, this letter, in he was a, a, the book of Hebrews was a letter written to Jews. And a lot of them are obviously Jews who have become Christians, become followers of Jesus. And the letter up to this point 
I'm just going to give you a quick summary. It's almost over in chapter 10, but this has been a little bit about what it's about. The letter describes the supremacy of Jesus. The writer of Hebrews, he talks about how Jesus is greater than Moses and how Jesus is greater than Abraham. It even implies how Jesus is greater than David. And he talks about how Jesus is greater than all the high priests that ever served in the temple and how His sacrifice as the Lamb of God was the sacrifice to end all sacrifices and there's no longer any need for all that stuff. That's basically what the writer of Hebrews has been saying. And so that's the reason when you get to verse 19, it begins with the word therefore. Because he's been describing all this stuff that Jesus has done and why he's greater. And he says, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. And he talks about by this new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain. And then he calls it his flesh. Y'all know what he's talking about, don't you? Do you remember when Jesus died on the cross? He made atonement for the sins of the whole world. And when he died, the Bible tells us that the curtain in the temple that, that separated the holy place from the most holy of holies was torn from top to bottom. And it opened up access into the very presence of God. And so that's what happened, and this is what the author is referring to here. It was Jesus' flesh, his, his suffering that opened up access to God. And Jesus has become that great high priest that he speaks about in verse 21. And so all this is symbolism of the tabernacle and the temple. You know, the, the place, that holy of holies, was kind of in the center and toward the back uh, of, of the temple or, or the tabernacle that they had in the wilderness. And then they, later they built the temple in Jerusalem and it was patterned the same way. And in that Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant. And in the center of the Ark of the Covenant was the mercy seat. And one day a year, the, only one person was allowed to go in there and that was the high priest and only on the Day of Atonement, and his duty was to go in there and sprinkle the blood of a perfect male lamb on that mercy seat to make atonement for the sins of the entire Israelite nation. And it was symbolizing, obviously, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross that opened up access, that curtain was torn, and now everyone equally has access into the very presence of God because of the blood of Jesus. Listen, Jesus is the way to have fellowship with the Father. He made the way. He is the way. So in verse 22, because of that, we read, we are, to, we are urged to draw near to God with a true heart. With a true heart. You see, it is possible to seek God with a false heart. It is possible to kind of pretend, isn't it? Or maybe even to, to try to uh, go to God with the wrong motives. Maybe they're selfish or whatever, but we know in Matthew chapter 7 that there are a lot of people that will be surprised when they stand before God on that day because He'll tell them that He never knew them. And, and, and they don't see it coming. And it's probably because they sought God with a false heart. They didn't walk in faith. So, the writer of Hebrews, and I today, I'm urging you, seek God with your whole heart, with a true heart. Seek Him. You see, God wants, wants you to give your heart to Him. Proverbs 23, 26 says, My son, give me your heart. Give me your heart. God wants our heart. The heart's the center of our desires, the center of what we want. God wants that. God wants to be our heart's desire. That's what it's talking about. That, that's kind of what He's getting at. And, and, and God wants that from you. God wants us to have a heart to know Him. The prophet Jeremiah wrote in, in Jeremiah 24, 7, he said, I will give them a heart to know that I am the Lord. And they shall be my people, they will be my people, and I will be their God, for they will return to me with their whole heart. God's made a way for us to give our hearts to Him. Seek Him. With all your heart. Jesus has made a way for us to draw near to God. So, so don't halfway seek Him. Don't be satisfied with just a glimpse in the room He's in. You follow me? Don't be satisfied uh, you know, to, to just walk by and get a glimpse of where Jesus is. 
He's invited us into the deepest, most intimate relationship we can have with Him. And that means just being in a room with Him is not enough. You see what I'm saying? He wants us in His lap. You, you know? He wants that, that closeness. And folks, once you, once you have that with Jesus, you'll want it too. You know, that, that's what He wants. In 1999, I went to Uganda on a mission trip. And, and while on that trip, my heart began to grow for missions. And, and uh, while we were there, I asked the, the, the national guy to, uh, that was helping us with the mission trip, the Ugandan uh, pastor, to take me to some missionaries that, who, who lived there in Uganda and served there. Because I wanted to, um, to talk to them about what it was like to live there and serve God there. I wanted to learn more about that. And, and uh, unfortunately, one day as we were out and we were driving to one of the places where we were ministering, our van pulled up beside this house and, and uh, the guy that I was missing, the leader, um, his name escapes him right now for some reason. Anyway, he turned and he, and he looked at me and he said, Derek, this, this is where the missionaries live. And we took off. And my heart dropped. I thought, wait a minute, you know. I, 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 it was a big letdown. I wanted to get closer. I, I wanted to talk to them. I wanted to learn from them. I wanted to pray for them. I, you know, I, I wanted to be there with them. I wanted to see what it was like just, if, just for a few minutes. But I didn't get that opportunity, you know. And in a similar way, you know, we've got to seek God with our whole heart. Don't just drive by in your quiet time. You know, don't just don't let it be a passive moment. Don't go for just a glimpse of a passage every now and then. <laughs> you know, spend deep, meaningful moments in prayer and delve into the, into the depths and the riches of the Word of God and know Him more fully by repenting of sin and stepping out in faith and walking in His ways. That's how you get closer to God. That's how you get closer to Jesus. You see, climb in His lap and stay a while. <laughs> the Father wants to love you. Will you let him? Will you let him? You want to get closer? God wants you closer. So seek him with your whole heart. And the second, the second action that we're, we're to take is not only should we seek God with our whole heart, but if you want, if you want to get closer, if you want to be able to defeat those things in your life that that, that plague you, stand on God's promises. Stand on God's promises. Look at verse 23 with me. God's Word says in verse 23, He says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For He who promised is faithful. See that? Let us hold fast. That word, hold fast, has the sense of securing or tightening down our confession of hope. And so, so what, what does this mean? And he says that to do this without wavering. So we can't get off balance. We can't get unlevel as if we had a bad foundation. We must stand firm. So this is about our faith. This is about believing the promises of God. This is about acting on the promises of God. See, it's one thing to say you love Jesus, and it's another thing to live like you love Jesus. See, that's the difference. Standing on the promises of of God. That's living out in faith. That's taking a step when God calls you to do something and maybe you're afraid but you trust Him anyway and you do it. That's what He's talking about. So we've got to trust that what God says is out there for us that He's got our back and He's going to watch out for us, right? That, that's what we're looking at. So what it means is we've got to be able to stand firm in the winds of life that blow as trials, that, that, that try to uproot us and turn us away from the God who created us and redeemed us with His own blood. You know, uh, the trials of life, Satan will try to use the trials of life to turn you against God, but God wants to use the trials of life to turn you to Him. We've got to turn to Him. That's when we trust Him. That's when we stand on His promises. We don't believe Him, we turn away. We abandon the church, we abandon the faith, and the next thing we know, we're depressed and defeated, and life sucks, to put it bluntly. Right? That's what happens. But when, when the circumstances of life appear to be laughing at us, 
And even though things become difficult, and even in the moment we feel there's little reason for going on, we can stand on God's promises. You know, the one who made the promise is faithful, and He will never let us down. Yeah, life may be tough in, uh, today. It was tough for Jesus too, remember? They killed Him on a cross. But all the day, <laughs> with what God has in store, that's what we have to look forward to, folks. Oh, you got to believe that promise. You see, there are some that will leave when things get tough. They'll leave the church and they'll leave the faith. And, and you know, we've had probably close to 200 different people come through the Fellowship Church in the last nine months or so. I don't know. It looks like we may have 50 or more here today. Praise the Lord for that. Uh, but you know, a lot of them have, have gone different ways. Some of them to other churches, to other ministry. Praise the Lord. But a lot of them just not, just not faithful maybe. Just not walking with the Lord maybe. I don't know. But look, when things got tough, a lot of the folks, they left Jesus too. If you look in John chapter 6, Jesus uh, was preaching and, and, and uh, he, he told them in verse 64, He said, but there's some of you who don't believe. That's what He told them. Some of you just don't believe. You don't have faith. That's what He's saying. You don't believe the promises of God. And, and, and so then it says uh, that from that point on, a lot of them left. Okay? Living for Jesus is tough. It is. <laughs> don't think that you know. Don't think that that when you when you become a Christian, that life's going to get easy. It's not. But you can have peace and joy in the midst of life's most difficult times because you know Jesus. That's the truth. <laughs> you know, you'll face trials and tough times. You'll be tempted to go and leave your relationship with Jesus, and you'll have excuses that you know. Say, if you don't want to go to church, you don't want to be a part of the church. Satan will give you excuses. There's plenty of them. And you just pick one. And, and, and just don't, don't be a part of a church. And don't spend time with Jesus. And just go live life your way. There's plenty of excuses. And, you know, and, and Jesus implied that those didn't, that left, they didn't believe. Unbelief is the problem, he said. He didn't really imply it. He said it. Listen, folks. Believe. Believe. Have faith in God when your pathway is lonely. Have faith in God. He's on His throne. He watches over His own. Have faith in God. Believe. Hold fast to the confession of hope. Stand on God's promises. He Listen, there's a better day coming. One day we'll all be gathered by Him. And we'll live in a place where there's no more death. And there's no more disease. And there's no more sorrow. And there's no more despair. And there's no more divorce. And there's no more handicaps. What a day that will be. Amen? What a day. Believe, folks. Believe. Because Satan don't want you to believe. Because he wants you to live life the way you want to live it. And he wants to rob you of the blessings that God can give you now and in eternity. Don't believe him. He's a liar. Amen. But our God is truth. Believe him. Stand on God's promises. And stand, my friend, on judgment day. A little boy years ago... The father took him on a little trip and, and he left the little boy outside of a dime store. And he told him, he said, I've got to go to a meeting. I'll be back in about half an hour. And he said, just, just stay here and I'll be back. And I'll get you. And so he left the little boy standing there to play on the street corner. And, and people don't do this nowadays, I guess. But you know, maybe depending on where you are. But, but um, as he went down to his meeting, his car broke down. And uh, he didn't have a phone. He couldn't call, and he, you know, he couldn't let the boy know. And, and three hours went by, and four hours went by, and five hours went by, and and the little boy was on on the corner in front of this dime store. And finally, the father was able to get back to him. And when he got back to him, he said, he, by that time, the father was in a state of panic. You know, he and when he saw his son standing there, you know, after his car had been repaired, and the little fellow was just standing there, kind of rocking back and forth on his feet, looking in the dime store, just looking around. The father ran up to him and he threw his arms around him and he kissed him and he kissed him. He said, oh, he says, what, you worried? Weren't you worried? 
did you think I was never coming back? And, and the little guy just looked up, you know, in his dad's eye, and he said, no, Dad, I knew you were coming back because you said you were. Faith. Standing on the promise of the Father. You see, that's how God is. Isn't it? That's how God is. You know what? It may seem like a long time. It may seem painful in the meantime. But He'll be here. He'll be here. And it'll be just like He said it would. Won't it? <laughs> Listen, He is faithful. He promised. We can trust Him. So when things get tough in your life and you think God's not around and you feel abandoned, remember, He's faithful. God always keeps His promises. Believe. Believe. We don't have any other hope but to believe and trust in Jesus, don't we? There's no other hope, folks. Believe. Don't stop seeking Him. Remember His promise. Stay faithful. Walk in obedience. Be courageous. Patiently wait on Him. You want to get closer? You want to get closer? Seek God with your whole heart. And stand on God's promises. The third action we want to take, if you want to get closer, is this. Spend time loving one another. Spend time loving one another. Amen? How many of you like people to love on you? Huh? How many? Uh, what? <laughs> Bunch of liars in here this morning. Everybody wants to be loved on. Come on. You know what I'm talking about. We want to be loved, don't we? If you want to be loved, you got to love, don't you? We love God because He loved us. we got to spend time loving on one another. Look at verses 24 and 25 with me. He wraps kind of, up, uh, wrap, kind of wraps up this section in this way. He says, Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see that day drawing near. They getting closer. So, see, here's what was happening. Many of the Jewish Christians in the early church, when, when, when things got tough, they were abandoning the fellowship. They were abandoning the gathering. They weren't coming together. And, and it, you know, the reason they were doing it was because of the persecution. They, they didn't want to be identified as Christians. And so when things got tough, they just went back to their old way of life. That's what they did. Because, you know, frankly, just being a Christian sometimes is just too tough, I guess. You know, and so that's what was happening. So, look, you'll be tempted to do that if you follow Christ. And if you stop gathering with other believers to encourage you and build, build you up, you won't make it. If you try to live like a Christian on your own, you won't make it. God didn't design us to be Christians living on our own out here in isolation somewhere. He designed the whole uh, uh, church, the whole relationship to be lived in companionship and love with and for one another. We need each other. That's what, you know, there are no long, long range of Christians that will stand on Judgment Day. We need one another. We, we need the church. And, and, and so if we're going to make it, and keep the faith in these difficult days, we need three things. An intimate relationship with Jesus, our faith, and we need one another. Basically what we're talking about here this morning. Those three things. And so, look, to consider how to stir up love and good works, you know, that's what he talks about there in verse 24. Stir up, consider that. How, how do you stir up love and good works? Let me ask you something. How much time do you spend thinking about ways you can love your brothers and sisters in Christ. We can all spend a little bit more time thinking about ways and considering ways that we can love one another, couldn't we? We ought to think about, we ought to intentionally think about that more. People in our, look, how often do you pray and seek ways to glorify God by, by good works that we can do together? Huh? Think about that. We need to pray and seek God and let God speak through us to enlighten us in the ways that we can each use our gifts together to bring glory to God and serve our community and tell them about Jesus. People in our world, you know what people in our world need? People in our world need to see how much Christian people love one another. Don't they? Unfortunately, 
it doesn't take long for a church to get the reputation of a bickering bunch of believers, right? That's what happens. I mean, it is. That's what happens when we get selfish and when we get self-centered. You know, when we put God first and focus on reaching and serving our community, people see our love for God, they see our love for them, and they see our love for one another. And that's where we have the word for stir one up here, where it says to stir one up to love and good works. Y'all going to like this. You know what that word can be translated like? Irritate. Irritate one another to love and good works. Hey, hey I finally found something I'm good at. Right? My spiritual gift is irritation and aggravation. I'm telling you. And, and so it, this, is something, this is something I'm good at. But that's what it literally means. I believe the implication is us is for us to constantly be pressing one another to do the right things, to come alongside one another for God's work, to love one another and to work together. That's what it is. We, we got to badger one another and they have to keep ourselves in line, don't, don't we? Somebody's got to badger me to keep me in line. Somebody's got to badger. Don't get mad at me when I call you out. Look, I'm trying to help you. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of the way it is. We got to do it in love, right? We all need that. And that, that's really what he's talking about. Notice in verse 25, we're told not to neglect meeting together. So, so we're to love one another and encourage one another and work together. And we're together together. Listen, let's not underestimate the importance of gathering as believers. Y'all know that I've been preaching this ever since we started the fellowship. I've heard so many times, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. How many of y'all have heard that? I've heard it hundreds and hundreds of times. Hey, well, hey, maybe not. But to act like a Christian, you do need to go to church, okay? I mean, Christians meet with other Christians. They gather together and they do the work of God. Now, you don't have to, but to you don't say, well, I don't have to go to church to be saved and go to heaven. Yeah, that's right. But to act like a Christian, you need to be part of a body of believers that gathers together and carries out God's work. That's just the truth. You know, that's what this, this verse is about. Make good, faithful Christians go to church on a regular basis. You want to be like Jesus? Jesus went to synagogue. He always went to synagogue. Did Jesus need to go to synagogue to be Jesus? No, He didn't. But guess what? He did. Because that, that was the way He was a Jew and Jesus was a Jew. Right? I mean, just listen to, to me for a minute. Look, now... Going into a brick building with a steeple don't make you a Christian any more than going into a garage makes you a car. All right? I mean, it just don't. But we've got to be a part of the church. We've got to be a part of a local body of believers that gathers together on a regular basis. Don't forsake that. Don't neglect that. Don't stop the gathering. You need to be a part. That's why we emphasize the importance of the fellowship of our small groups. And I try to encourage you guys. No, it's not just about what we do on Sunday morning. We, well, I want you to meet with other believers in your home. Have hope for meals. Open the Bible. Pray. Invite lost people. Play games. Do all these things. Listen, I need you. You need me. You need him. He needs you. We all need each other, right? And we all need Jesus. Amen? We all need Jesus. Oh, man. You see, if we love Jesus, we'll love one another. We love Jesus when we love one another. And look, he's not talking about sneaking in the back door of the church building just as worship begins and sneaking out as soon as the service is over. That's not what he's talking about. That's not really gathering. What he's talking about is this, doing life together, coming together regularly for worship, praying together, sharing meals together, playing games together, having long chats together. He's talking about studying the Word of God together. He's talking about working together. He's talking about helping one another up from when we fall down. He's talking about confronting one another for sin. He's talking about sacrificing for one another so that needs can be met. Uh, he, he's talking about evangelizing our lost neighbors together. And he's talking about preaching the gospel to the ends of the earth together. That's the kind of gathering he's talking about, okay? That's what, that's what Christians are a part of. Because a lot of people, you know, look, a lot of people say, well, hey, I go to church, I, I walk in, I listen to the message, I sing a few songs, I go home, I got my card punched, God's okay. Look, that's not going to 
help you stand in trials. What's going to help you stand in trials is when you're so close to everybody else, when the wind starts blowing, it ain't going to blow nobody down. Because Jesus is in the middle and we're attached to him and he ain't going down. You getting the picture? This is what we're talking about. When we live life that way, coming together in all those ways, God's love is loud. God's love is loud. People take notice and lives are changed forever. That's what needs to happen. Listen, we need to come together. We need to stand together as we serve our Lord together. Amen? When times get tough, we need one another. The Lone Ranger and Tonto were out riding out west. It's a true story, by the way. Okay. Some of you get it. But, but the Lone Ranger and Tonto, they were, they were riding out west, right? And, and they were headed north when they ran up on a thousand braves. They were charging right toward them. And the Lone Ranger looked at Tonto and he said, What do we do? And Tonto said, We go south. Kimbo Saudi? That's the right word? Yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. And so no more than they turned, they saw a thousand Indian warriors headed north right at them, charging again with a war call. And, and the Lone Ranger looks at Tonto again and he says, Tonto, what do we do? And Tonto says, we go west, Kimbo Saudi. And so they turned west and they ride west a little ways and then they see a thousand warriors coming at them from the west. And the Lone Ranger he turns to Tonto and says, Tonto, what do we do now? And Tonto says, we go east, Kimo Sabi. And so they go east and they, they ride east and all of a sudden they look and a thousand more braves headed right at them from the east. And the Lone, they just pull up and their horses stop and the Lone Ranger looks at Tonto and he says, Tonto, says, what do we do now? And Tonto says, what do you mean, we, pale face? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> no longer connected. No longer loved, right? Unfortunately, you know, <laughs> for the Lone Ranger, it was about to get ugly. Oh, man. And it can get ugly for us. We're no longer connected. We're on our own. Surrounded by all of life's troubles. We can get up there. If we really love Jesus, we love one another. We won't abandon one another. We'll help one another. God's promise is I'll never leave you or forsake you. And we've got to have that kind of promise for one another. There's a, listen, there's a direct link between the love and the gathering. It's a direct, direct link. You know, you tend to spend time with the people you love most. And you tend to, 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 to do activities that you love most. You know, you, you do those things. and stuff. Let me ask you something this morning. How much time do you spend with Jesus? How much time do you spend with God's people? How much of what you do do you do for God's glory? Those are good questions, aren't they? And that's why God created us. To have fellowship with Him, to have fellowship with one another, and to live and work and act for His glory, for, for the building of God's kingdom, for the exalting of Jesus' name. In John chapter 13, Jesus says this. He says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, he said, you also are to love one another. And he said this, by this will all people know that you are my disciples. If you love one another. <laughs> we got to love one another. We got to love one another. If we love Jesus, we're going to love one another. You know, as I prepared my doctoral dissertation a couple of summers ago, doing my research and putting everything together, I knew a day was coming when I'd have to give a defense, you know, of my research and, and, and my, my paper. And it was a day that I longed for. I tell you, I couldn't wait for it to get there. But, the, you know, I wasn't sure when it was going to be. You know, I just kept working. I kept writing. And I'd, I'd send my work to my chair and to my readers. And, and she kept sending it back, telling me other stuff I needed to do, you know stuff I need to fix and all this. I, I, I didn't know if I was ever going to get done. 
Then one day I sent it in. And she replied, you're ready. Let's set a date for the defense. I knew then it was almost over, you know? It was a day I longed for. It was a day that, that I was waiting for. It was, it was a day that was drawn closer. I knew it was drawn closer. I didn't know exactly when it would be. But my friends, let me tell you something. Jesus is standing at the right hand of the Father. There's a day that's getting closer. It's getting closer. Day by day. Every minute that day's getting closer. Now we don't know exactly what it's going to be. But we wait for it with great anticipation. And one day soon, Father will turn to the Son and He'll say it's time. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you getting closer to, to God? Are you getting closer to Jesus? Are you getting closer to your family faith? Like are, you, are you standing on God's promises? Are you doing those things? Look, you can be ready for that day if you'll commit to these three, three things. Seek God with your whole heart. Stand on the promises of God. And spend time loving one another. Do that. Let's all bow our heads as we get ready for, for a hymn of invitation this morning. It's a time of response. And we just want to invite you this morning. Maybe this morning God has spoken to you. And uh, maybe you're here this morning and, and, and you don't know if you died today. You don't know where you're going to spend eternity. You don't know what's going to happen when you stand before God on that day. Well, listen to me. The Bible says that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So right now, with every head bowed, every eye closed, look, if you'll just pray a prayer this morning and say, Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and I'm in need of your forgiveness. And right now, Lord, I call out to you, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and life. Take over the throne of my heart, Lord, and let me live for you. If you'll pray a prayer like that, the Bible says, Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Will you pray that prayer this morning? And give it to give your life to Jesus. Maybe you're here and you say, Derek, I, I've been a believer for a long time, but I've not been living like a believer. My life's been a mess. And I know it's because I've not been walking in God's ways. But today I want to commit to seeking God with my whole heart. I want to stand and renew my faith and stand on God's promises. And I want to be a part of the fellowship. I want to be a part of, of spending time loving God and loving His people. Will you do that today? Just pray a prayer of faith and call out to Jesus right now and say, Lord, forgive me and help me, Lord, to, to walk in your ways. Ask Him to give you that courage and that faith. Will you do that this morning? Maybe there's other things today that God's speaking to your heart about. Just give those to the Lord. As we sing, we want to ask you to step out. And, and if you want to, you can come down here and we'll pray here. Let's get things right with the Lord right now. Father, we give you this time. Be glorified in this invitation. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's stand together. God's speaking to you. Come on, let's get things going.